Welcome back, everybody, to The Social Brain. I can't believe it's episode 16 already. Uh, we love doing this. Uh, we've been kind of on a, a kick lately of human flourishing. It's something that, that we're really interested in. We hope that it's something that's, that, that you all as the listeners are interested in. And this one is, uh, is a really cool topic. I mean, we're talking about positive psychology, uh, looking at psychology through a kind of positive instead of a negative lens, like so much of psychology was was negative for so long. And now we're thinking about what makes us happy, what gives us a sense of well-being, right? So uh, I'm Taylor Guthrie. I run the channel The Cellular Republic. And this is my co-host, Andrew Cooper Sansone, runs the channel Sense of Mind. Uh, and this is this awesome thing that we do together. So I'm going to kick it over to him and he's going to tell you what we're going to talk about. Yeah, thank you. Um, all right. Yeah. So like Taylor mentioned, today we're talking about mostly about positive psychology, but also kind of happiness, the, the science of human flourishing generally. Um, and I guess just to start out, I'll just say like neither of us are super experts in this or anything <laughs> like that. We, we're just super interested in it and been, um, want to communicate some of that excitement and uh, interest to you guys. And we'll be listing some different uh, references and stuff throughout this that we can point you to. We'll link it in the show notes in the description. Um, but I guess I just want to start out by saying, like, why is this important? You know, sometimes when people talk about happiness, it seems like this sort of um, like extra. It's like icing on the cake. It's it's not really the important thing. But I I really think I've come to believe, especially reading through some of this literature and hearing talks from from some of the top researchers in the field, um, it's. I think that one of the most important questions we can ask ourselves is how can I be happier? What what uh, levers are there available to me in my mind that I can pull to kind of improve my day-to-day -day existence above and beyond just sort of tamping down the suffering or the mental illness? Um, I mean, I think a lot of us increasingly uh, do deal with issues like depression and anxiety and, um, and those kinds of like negative uh, conditions. But on the other hand, there is this whole field of applied psychology aimed at really helping people, individuals to flourish, to improve their experience. And um, yeah, so I I think we're going to be talking about all that today. Um, but as Taylor mentioned, like for so long in psychology, there was this bias toward only focusing on the negative, only focusing on what's wrong with people, what are our deficits, what are the mental illnesses, and how can we come up with ways to treat them, um, working on what's called like the disease model, because, um, you know, we're talking about how to treat diseases, mental illness, rather than kind of the positive mental health. And so um, the, the sort of founder of this area of psychology, which really came about in the late 1990s, um, but has roots going back deeper into the early 20th, early 20th century and also with humanistic psychology earlier than that. Um, but uh, that was Martin Seligman. He's uh, really well known in this field. He's um, just done some amazing work on on these kinds of things. And so just want to give that as like a historical perspective um, that this is a pretty new area and uh, and it's uh, fascinating, and, and we're going to jump into it. I think now. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I, I want to I want to kind of uh, put a caveat out there that a lot of what we might talk about might seem a little trite or obvious, right? It's like it's like spend t more time with friends, <laughs> sleep better, like think more positively. Like we're not trying to say like think your way into being happy. We're trying to say that. There are some some really interesting studies that have shown that if you engage in certain practices, if you do a little bit every day to to try to change your habits, to try to change the way that you interact with your world, that these types of activities do overall looking across hundreds and hundreds of people bring people more satisfaction, more happiness. Uh, but you also have to realize that there's there's a huge comparative effect going on here that whenever you're thinking about being happy, whenever we're thinking about measuring happiness, right? There's no like set way to actually like say, I'm happier than you and you're happier than this person or whatever. It's all based on, on you and how you report being happy, right? 
And so I just wanted to kind of lay that out there because some of the stuff it's, it's like telling you to not eat donuts. We've talked about that before on this, this <laughs> podcast, right? It's, it's not enough to just know what to do, right? You really have to have the motivation and you have to do the kind of the value work and say like, is this something that I really value? Am I motivated to be happier? And if that's the case, if you answer yes to that question, then some of the stuff that we're going to talk about is going to give you those tools to actually do that. Yeah, that's such a good point. That motivation piece is like extremely important. Um, we'd mentioned on our last episode about self-control where um, just believing that you can change, that you can improve is an important prerequisite for actually being able to achieve those improvements. Um, so whether it's uh, becoming less mentally ill or more mentally healthy, uh, however you want to think about that, uh, there's a huge role for for understanding that you can change and then having that motivation to actually do it and stick with it. Um, but yeah, I think uh, throughout this, we've kind of been talking about what, what the sort of main focus of positive psychology is. It's not just making people more joyful or having more pleasure in their lives. It's like giving uh, the tools and, and creating those tools um, through evidence based um, science to figure out how do we actually allow people to flourish, to have not only lots of joy and positive emotions in their life, but also meaning. And um, that kind of gets to um, what is often seen as kind of like the central model of, uh, of positive psychology. And again, I'm not a positive psychologist, so <laughs> I might be mischaracterizing that a little bit, but, but this is often referenced. Um, it's called the PERMA model, and this was developed by Martin Seligman, who I just mentioned. Um, and so PERMA is an acronym that stands for, or it's P-E-R-M-A, and it's kind of the five core elements of uh, psychological well-being and happiness that have emerged from this research. Um, and so P is positive emotions. E is engagement. So like engagement with things you do, with activities, with work. Um, R is relationships. M is meaning. And A is accomplishments or achievements. And um, and it's, it's thought that like by maximizing and sort of optimizing those five elements that you can achieve a greater level of well-being. And um, I think uh, like, like Taylor said, it's kind of obvious, right? Like if you have more positive emotions, more engagement, better relationships, more meaning and accomplishments in your life, of course, that's going to be a better life. But I think that getting kind of this, this model and these uh, explicit ideas can allow you to categorize, okay, where am I maybe um, lacking? Where, where's things, where are things really strong in my life? Um, so that's kind of the, the PERMA model in a nutshell. And then I'll just mention um, that there are variations on this. Uh, so there's the PERMA, PERMA with an H <laughs> at the end, uh, which stands for health. So kind of added as, as a sixth element that, um, you know, whether you want to think of that as more of a prerequisite for these things, or if it's actually part of this model of well-being, um, there's, there's some variations. And differences in uh, thinking among researchers in the field. And I think something that's that's really interesting and important to notice about what you just went through, Andrew, is that uh, when you think about happiness, like you have this, this image of someone smiling, right? Of walking through the, the world with lots of joy or whatever. Uh, that's only a really small part of this, right? Uh, the positive emotions is part of it, right? This hedonic feeling of like feeling good about what I'm doing, but that's that's a really small part of it, right? There's so many other things that go into our overall sense of well-being, whether we're engaged in what we're doing. We've talked a lot about that on this show, this idea of flow, of really kind of being focused and being kind of in the moment, uh, being like loving what you're doing, right? Uh, but then you have meaning, which I think is, one of the the big ones right you have you have so, certain people that would not be people that you would describe as happy they're not walking around with big smiles on their face like talking to everybody all gregarious 
Uh, but they're people that live really meaningful lives. And that meaning gives them a sense of well-being. They're working towards something that they value, something that that they love to do, right? I mean, that helps with the engagement. If you're if you're doing something meaningful, you can engage in it, right? Uh, but I think that was something that I really wanted to, to kind of highlight when you start thinking about happiness and well-being is that it's not just about putting a smile on your face. It's about doing an inventory in all of these different domains and saying like, yes, I'm doing things that are giving me pleasure, but am I doing things that I enjoy doing? Am I doing things that are sending me down a path that, that helps me define who I am, that gives me some sense of meaning in my life? Uh, am I taking care of my body? Am I being healthy, right? Uh, am I accomplishing things? Am I being recognized by people around me? Am I forming these, these great social bonds with people and being intimate with people? Uh, each of those in their own, like you can be intimate in a social engagement in a way that's not happy, right? You can be giving someone support. You can be a shoulder to cry on. Like that's not a happy moment, but it still gives you a very high sense of well-being. Right. So I think one of the big things that we really want to get out of this episode is to start thinking more broadly about the idea of happiness and well-being and start actually spending some frontal lobe time like doing an inventory of these different things and thinking about where you are on these different categories. Yeah, that's a great point, um, because it's all, it really points to this this like uh, often cited idea that happiness is at least has kind of two basic parts to it, like pleasure, um, joy, positive emotions on the one hand, and what's sometimes called eudaimonia or um, meaning and purpose on the other hand. And I think that's kind of the dichotomy or the, the two elements, the kind of basic building blocks of happiness that Taylor is talking about. And uh, I think you could see it, and, and I tend to see it this way, that those meaningful experiences, uh, the, the different things that you engage in that aren't necessarily um, just putting a smile on your face or making you feel really good in the moment, but are more meaningful, like being a shoulder to cry on or being um, supportive to somebody who needs it uh, or, or doing what's called like a type two experience, something that's uh, good it's a good experience that you look back on, but very difficult in the moment, like hiking a, a crazy, you know, mountain peak or something like that. Um, but I tend to see that as the, there does seem to be an aspect of we're, we're going after this positivity. Like there, there is in the end, there's some positive experience that is going to result from all of that uh, sort of meaningful eudaimonic uh, activity and, and behaviors that we're doing. Um, but you know, that's, that's a little bit beside the point. I think it's, it is really important to see that for a full flourishing, good life. It can't just be pleasure. I mean, you know, unfortunately I think that's, uh, how, you know, we can see that in, in the, the lives of people who are severely addicted to certain drugs. It can be, well, like this is the only source of, of goodness in my life. And so I'll just keep going after that. And it, of course, often, most often destroys their lives and is not, that is not a life we'd point to and be like, oh, that's someone who's really flourishing. So I think uh, it's definitely good to keep all that in mind. And I think this ties into a lot of the things that we've talked about before on this show, uh, where moments of pleasure are actually very sparse compared to moments of desire right? Moments of, of seeking things. Uh, and it's it's really about turning that desire, turning that, that wanting into something that is pleasurable, like the pursuit itself being something that, that gives you purpose, that gives you meaning, right? Um, like, and even, you know, even if you're working some menial job that you hate, do a value inventory, right? Why am I working this job, right? It's not that the job itself is giving me meaning, what values is it contributing to that are outside of just this job, right? Uh, it's giving me the money to allow me to do the things that I love to do, to spend time with the people that I love to spend time with, right? It's it's about recontextualizing a lot of these things in our lives that, that may seem really like downers, right? Like I hate my job, I hate my boss, I hate these things, right? Uh, but when you really spend the, those moments, like thinking about what your values are, 
Like, what is it that drives you to keep going forward, to wake up every day, to do the things that you're doing? When you bring those things to the forefront, and lots of science shows this, if you do a values inventory before you do something unpleasant, you have a much better time. Like, you, you see that activity for what it actually is and what it's getting you. Right. This is this amazing superpower that I've talked about so many times on this show is this ability that we have to to recontextualize, to imagine, to see the future. Right. The frontal lobe gives us this amazing ability to abstract away from the current moment and to tie it to our purpose, to tie it to our sense of meaning. Uh, and so it's and, and I think this is something I was thinking about this earlier, Andrew, the the idea of like pleasure versus meaning. And I think there's a very developmental component here that uh, especially like early adulthood and like teenage years, things are very hedonic. It's like, I want pleasure. I want to experience <laughs> all of these things that, that make me feel good. Um, and you're going through this process through early adulthood, through kind of teenage years and things like that of, of finding it is, finding what your values actually are, figuring out like what it is that you're working for, what it is that you want to do, what you want to contribute and everything like that. Uh, and so as you go through life, just realize that these things are probably going to bounce around a little bit and that one is going to maybe be more important than the other at, di at different times. Yeah, that's a really good point. People are at different stages and different, we all just have different lives. And uh, yeah, that, that values inventory is so important. Defining what your values are, what really matters to you, and then, you know, under, or organizing your life around that. Um, is probably one of the most important things you can do. Um, so that being said, uh, maybe we can move into some of these actual strategies and interventions that have emerged from positive psychology and related uh, subfields of psychology um, that have been shown to actually make meaningful differences to our happiness and well-being. Um, before we get to that, I just wanted to, to look at, I noticed we had a couple um, messages in the chat and throughout this uh, episode, feel free to throw in whatever thoughts or comments, questions you have into the chat. We'd love to kind of get that community going and talk in and uh, love to hear from everyone. So um, one is, uh, suppose I start reading a novel and got interested in it. Which hormones are responsible for it? <laughs> that's, a, that's an interesting question. Uh, I think that's one maybe like for another episode, but uh yeah, for well, if I you think get it, interested, yeah, it actually, yeah, no, yeah, it does. No, I think it, kind, I it does. Thinking. Yeah, yeah, because go for it. it. I mean, you're kind of getting into this idea of engagement, right? Uh, right? That's one of these these positive psychology elements. Is that like you are you're in a flow to a certain sense, right? You're you're in it. You're focused. This is something that's that's really important to you. That's in the moment. I. Uh, you there's there's kind of a, a distinction between the here and now chemicals and the like future chemicals right like dopamine is something that's really about the future it's about like striving for something that's not here yet and wanting something uh but then you have a lot of chemicals like serotonin and oxytocin and all of these other ones uh that are really about the like the here and now opiates uh cannabinoids like all of these that that make the the current moment feel pleasurable uh, and that's what I was kind of mentioning earlier. Like when you're in those moments, it's great. They do feel pleasurable, but they're rare, right? Like, because we have responsibilities, we have things that we have to do. Right. And so, uh, it's nice to have those moments and it's nice to maybe even plan to, to have parts of your day that are, that are around feeling pleasure and feeling these things. Uh, but I think so much more of, of what we're going to get into is, is how to then bring that sense of well being into those other moments that aren't necessarily enjoyable in the moment. Yeah. And I'll just mention uh, in response to that question, um, I'm going to have a video coming out soon about um, this idea of the pleasure cycle, which comes from the neuroscientists, um, Morton Kringlebach and Kent Barrage, who we talked about a little bit on this show before. Um, but yeah, there's this, there's definitely this, uh, cycle of, and I actually use the book, a book as an example in the video. So that's funny. <laughs> uh, you said novel, um, because yeah, getting the book and, and seeking it out, um, that, that motivation to get something that you enjoy to do something that you enjoy is probably going to be characterized by higher activity and kind of the dopamine dopaminergic reward or reward prediction error system 
um, the seeking system. We've sometimes talked about it. Um, and then actually the experience of enjoying the book and reading it and owning it, um, that might be more like actual uh, actual pleasure experience where um, there's this activity of what are called like hedonic hotspots. And those tend to be activated by, as Taylor mentioned, endogenous opioids and uh, cannabinoids, endocannabinoids. Um, so to answer your question, that I guess none of those are technically hormones. Um, but they're all neurotransmitters or um, neuromodulators. So um, we can, I'll, I'll have a video coming out about similar topics soon. And you can also check out my video on, on pleasure and our episodes on flow and on motivation if you're interested in kind of getting more into that. Um, so uh, thank you for the, yeah, yes. Back to the interventions <laughs> yeah, and strategies. So the first one is kind of obvious as Taylor mentioned, but it's something that we, it's really easy, especially in the modern world, especially post COVID, if you're at all working at home, um, it's easy to overlook this one and it's fostering strong social connections or at least meaningful social connections. Um, <laughs> Taylor had a small, uh, technical I mess on my desk. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, okay. So yeah. So the, uh, the kind of meaningful social connections and interactions are super important for people's happiness and well being. Um, and uh, I, I think one good thing to mention from the beginning is these don't have to be super strong connections. They don't have to be like you're interacting with your best friend or your spouse or whoever on a daily basis. It can even just be meaningful interactions that you have with strangers, you know, um, maybe uh, donating or, or giving, even just tipping someone at a, a restaurant could be <laughs> maybe a, one of these meaningful social interactions, depending on the context. But um, yeah, do you want to, you're the social yeah. scientist here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think one of the one of the things that I, I really want to challenge people with is that our assumptions about what is going to feel good and what is not going to feel good are usually wrong, especially when it comes to social situations. Uh, many of us have this sense that if we talk to a stranger, that it's going to be this miserable experience that it's <laughs> going to drown on or we're going to get stuck in this conversation or whatever it is. Uh, but the research shows that that's not true that talking to strangers is actually really good for our well-being. Um, I had this moment, so we've been doing this, this research, uh, and I had come across some of this stuff about talking to strangers, and it happened to me. I just went to a conference this last weekend, and I was on a plane, and I land, and this guy next to me just says, you know, I just got my three-minute pitch down. And I had this moment where I was just like, okay. <laughs> and... <laughs> And it was, it was that moment of like, oh, I'm on a plane, you know, I just want to like, I, I just want to get off. I want to do my thing, you know, and like maybe listen to my, my book or whatever. I, but I leaned in because I just like looked at this research and I just <laughs> seen like talking to strangers is good. Uh, and it ended up being a really cool conversation that I had with this guy about him doing this pitch for this app that he just created to try to get some money. And like, I, uh, and it was, I, I think meaningful for him too, to have someone to like, to bounce this off of like there was a reason he said something right there was a reason he he verbalized that something good just happened to him right uh and it was this moment where we got to share this this kind of gratitude between us right uh and we got to form some type of meaningful connection that would have otherwise not existed and something that andrew said that i think really rings true for i think a lot of us is that post covid we're very isolated and I mean, we as a species have become more and more and more isolated as we've gone into suburbia and like have become fixated on our screens and everything like that. We're living in this kind of digital world and we have to realize that a lot of our social interaction is done by our brain in a way where we're like interpreting facial impressions, right? We're, we're predicting what the other person's going to do. We're like, it, it's an engaged process. So like texting someone, it's great. It's, it's a form of meaningful connection, but it's not the stuff that our brain evolved to actually do in a social setting. We feel good when we see people smile. We feel good when our things that we're saying get recognized, right? Like I'm having a conversation and it looks like this person actually enjoys what I'm saying. It feels good. Uh, and so I think 
the the big thing is just that we have assumptions that that these things are going to be unpleasant. Uh, and I just want you to know that the research shows that that is definitely not the case, that overwhelmingly people report a lot of well-being from engaging with people that they wouldn't otherwise know. And like Andrew said, it doesn't have to be someone that you're really intimate with and not like sexual intimate, just like close with. Right. Uh, but like you have people that are probably cleaning the building that you work in. Say hi to them. S ask them how they are right? Like they probably need that. They probably feel like nobody recognizes them, that they're doing menial stuff, right? And that exchange is not just going to feel good for you. It's going to feel good for them too. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and if you, if you do work from home, if you do have the opportunity, it's always good to maybe branch out, go, go work in a more social atmosphere in a coffee shop or a library or something, just you know, to see those human faces, to get that actual social interaction. Um, that's, that's me these days for sure. <laughs> um, uh, but, um, oh yeah. And, and something I was going to mention uh, similar on this note about what, what our intuition tells us not always being reliable is, um, I've, I've been reading the book mindset by Carol Dweck, and it's about having a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. This idea that you can change that you can actually improve. As I was mentioning earlier, that being a prerequisite for the ability to actually improve and change. And uh, she mentions this really interesting research about shy people. And uh, if you are shy and you have kind of the fixed mindset, like I'm a shy person, nothing's gonna change. I just don't wanna get hurt. I just don't wanna be in this situation. Um, or if you're a shy person who's saying, okay, I'm shy, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to change. I'm going to tr try to stretch myself and uh, talk to these people and actually engage with this social environment. And maybe that'll be difficult. Maybe it'll be embarrassing, but maybe I'll grow from it too. And that it's shown that people who take on the growth mindset, even if they're shy, they over time start to become less shy in those social situations and they walk away from it with a much more positive experience than the people that go in thinking this is going to suck. I hate being with other people. I hate talking to them. Um, so that's a, uh, that's just a good thing to keep in mind on that same note. Um, and George Lee, thank you for the comment. I really appreciate that. Uh, just saying what we're likes what we're doing. So thank uh, you. George. Awesome. Um, and I wanted to kind of piggyback on what you were just saying, Andrew, uh, in that, as a parent, try not to label your child as shy, mm. right? Like that's something that, that I think I have a three-year-old. That's something I think a lot about is that like, what kind of messages am I sending as a parent that are maybe coming across as a fixed mindset message, right? Uh, and even things, I mean, there's a lot of things that, that Carolyn Dweck says too about like telling my, my son that he's amazing, right? Uh, it's, it's less about these, these labels and more about the opportunity to grow instead of saying like, you're shy, maybe like, oh, you know what? This is a really difficult situation that you're in right now. And, you know, it's, it's hard to, to talk to people that we don't know. Um, but, but we can try, right. And sometimes we don't have to, right. Uh, but it's, it's building that from the ground up that I think is really important, uh, because, these social interactions like we've been talking about are are paramount for us as a species. Like it's what we when we look back on our life at the end of our life, we're not thinking about whether or not we had a good job, whether or not we like made enough money or whatever it was. We're looking back at the the social stuff that we did, the meaningful social relationships that we had uh, and what we're kind of leaving in our legacy in terms of uh, the positive impact that we had on other people. Yeah. And, and that's why it's another reason why it's so important to do that values inventory and really look at what what is important to you and recognizing that that social and, um, connections are often some of the most important parts of your life. And to to really realize that and, and accept like, OK, this is an important thing that I need to try to uh, to get more of or or optimize or uh, engage with more in my life. Um, but it's not all about social interactions, although they're super important and maybe, <laughs> maybe most, uh, or, or a huge part of this, but, um, 
Another thing is uh, engagement. We talked about the, the PERMA model, the P-E-R-M-A, and we kind of just talked about R, the relationships. <laughs> but uh, E is also really important, engagement. And we've yeah. mentioned this previously on our episode on flow and on mindfulness. Um, but there's this uh, really famous paper, this uh, psych psychological paper that was published years, I think, in 2010, maybe. <laughs> Uh, I might be getting that wrong, um, and I'm not. I don't know who the authors are at the moment, but uh, it was titled "A Wandering Mind Is an Unhappy Mind," and uh, it, it really encapsulates this idea that when people are not engaged in what they're doing, even if what they're doing is not something that they inherently love to do, they are less happy. So when you are engaged in a task, whatever it is, if it's doing the dishes or doing you know work or uh, cleaning your house or, or anything. It could be the most meaningful or most menial task. Um, <laughs> that engagement, focusing on what you're doing and really putting yourself into it has been shown in this research to make people more satisfied, more uh, in, really more enjoying what they're doing and uh, to walk away with it as more of a positive experience. Lean in. Because, uh, yeah, even... When something is unenjoyable, that unenjoyable quality is usually psychological, right? It's something that we're convincing ourselves that we need to like run away from this thing, that we need to avoid this thing that we're engaging with. I hate doing the dishes. Oh God, the dishes just get higher and higher every day. They never end, right? <laughs> it's a story that we're, that we're telling us. I, it's something that I deal with every day, right? Uh, the laundry, folding the laundry, all of these things that are, that are awful find a way to, to, to just be in a state of kind of Zen while you're doing them, like feel the, the warmness of the water, like look at the bubbles, uh, smell the, the fragrance coming off of the soap, like engage your senses and be in the moment. Right. Uh, because even if doing the dishes is not as fun as watching Netflix, being present is going to get you out of that, default mode storytelling i need to run away from this this sucks thing uh which is really bringing a lot of your unhappiness right it's not dishes inherently don't create unhappiness uh it's that we would rather be doing something else yeah yeah that's a really great point and it's it's also like um you know when you when uh, the, the other thing is that watching netflix all day or doing just pleasurable <laughs> stuff all the time is eventually going to get really old. And so there, I think there's also this aspect of like when you're doing those difficult but necessary or boring but necessary tasks, uh, I think it, it does kind of give you that whatever dopamine detox in, in air quotes, <laughs> people can't see it, but uh, to, to bring you back down to a little bit more neutral level so that those everyday joys and um, good things in your life can be you know, a little bit more amplified because there's a little more signal to noise ratio, I guess so to speak. Um, but I, I guess I, I skipped over one that we were going to talk about before this, uh, another yeah. one of these great interventions. This is actually kind of my favorite one um, or a class of, of interventions, which are these gratitude and, and kindness practices. And um, the one that's really famous was developed again by Martin Seligman, um, the founder of this field of positive psychology. Um, and he calls it three good things. And uh, you'll sometimes hear this referred to as kind of a, a gratitude journal that you write down three things that you're grateful for that day. Um, but in his words, it's more like what went well today? And you kind of you make a list of three good things, three things that went well today. And then why did they go well? And and going into that, it's it's actually amazing. It, again, these these some of these practices seem so simple, like. Taylor said, like, they're almost trite. They're not like, they don't seem deep enough, but when you really get into that and you start thinking, okay, what did go well and why you start finding, okay, there's a lot of good things that I was doing today that I can replicate in the future that can give me these, these good outcomes that I'm looking for. And also just make you grateful for the people in your life that have helped you get to that point or the fortunate circumstances or your ability to overcome or face challenging and unfortunate circumstances. I think something that I like to lean on with some of these and to think about is that 
uh, and this kind of brings it into like a, a brain sense, right? That our brain is trying to be as efficient as possible. It's trying to use like the least amount of resources that it can. And it's really easy. We have this like negativity bias. It's really easy to recognize all of the things that we don't want to do, all of the things that we want to avoid. And that's something you can spend your entire day just saying, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. This sucks. Like, I hate this, right? Uh, it takes a lot of energy to sit down and to think about what things you do want to do and what things went well and what things are good. Uh, and I think something, this kind of wraps a ribbon around a lot of the things that we've been talking about that hasn't really been kind of stated out loud, but uh, this kind of thing, if you want more happiness in your life, takes work. Like, it's not just like be happy, right? Uh, it's if you want to be a stronger person, you go to the gym, you wake up every day, you spend time working out right? If you want to get a career, you wake up every day figuring out what you have to do to do that career. If you want to be happy, these things may seem trite, but you're not doing them. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. So it's like taking that time and like saying, yeah, okay, yeah, I just need to be more grateful, whatever. But like, are you, are you actually spending time thinking about what you're grateful for? Like, and I mean, we're in a very busy world these days, right? Like it, things are just constant. Like, I mean, I feel it. I'm doing a PhD. I'm working a second job as a professor. I'm running a, a co-hosting this like this <laughs> podcast, right? Uh, and so I feel like every minute of my day has to be accounted for. I have to be doing something productive every single minute of the day. Uh, and it's hard for me to, to think about like, okay, where is that self-care time? Because what we talked about are these like these six different categories, right? Of things that you need to, to meaningfully be putting time in on. And I'm not going to sit here and say like, I'm, I'm doing this podcast. That means I'm the happiest person in the world. Like I need to do a lot of work in a lot of these areas, right? And it's doing this, like having this conversation with you right now, Andrew, and with all of the people that are listening um, is motivation for me. It gives these things meaning to me, right? It helps me to, to bring them up on my values checklist, right? And I hope that whatever we're doing, talking to you about it is going to encourage you to like go from trite to maybe I should actually try this. I, I feel the same way. And I think uh, often it's like just getting started on it. You know, it's that first few minutes of like, ah, oh, this sucks. Like, <laughs> or this is, what is this? Why is this important? Yeah. But getting deeper into that and that engagement that we're talking about, actually engaging with it um, is a really important aspect of actually making these things work. And I want, I know your, um, your wife is a, a therapist and I wonder if it resonates with her that like clients, you know, might complain that therapy is not working, but maybe they're not putting in the work on the things that they have to do. So I, I wonder if there's a symmetry. There's there. a, there's an old joke in, uh, in therapy. Uh, how many therapists does it t take to change a light bulb? One, but the light bulb has to want to change. <laughs> uh, right. Uh, I mean, yeah. and it's, uh, when you really look at it, like therapy in general, like 80 to 90% of the success in therapy is the work that you're doing outside of the session. Right? You're coming in maybe once a week, once every two weeks for an hour, uh, and you're getting tools. You're, you're talking about things. You're unloading trauma and all of these things. But uh, it's it's that work you're doing outside, that self-compassion work, right? Like talking to your, like we just mentioned kindness. I think one of the most important things in terms of well-being is kindness to yourself. Like so many of us walk around every day just just beating ourselves up. Like I'm, I'm terrible. I'm awful. I'm not as good as this person. Like I... Uh, and, and a lot of it is because of the shame around us, right? The people that are talking to us in certain ways and uh, making us believe certain things about ourselves. Uh, something that was really powerful for me, because I, I had some of these issues, the way that I, I talked to myself. And I, the, I went through this activity with a therapist one time with self-compassion. And it said, I want you to write in this column, I want you to write all of the things that you say to yourself when you do something wrong. Now, what would you say to a friend that did that exact same thing mm -hmm. wrong? And that was, that was powerful. But then the last column was, what would you say to your child if they did something wrong? Right. And it really sets up this dichotomy of like, how are we, how are we treating ourselves? It's one thing to talk about being kind to other people and engaging with other people. But like, if we're not spending that time with ourselves, actually like appreciating ourselves, like being graceful with ourselves when we make mistakes, right? Uh, then none of this stuff is really going to work. 
Like you need to, you need to be in a place where you actually believe that you can achieve happiness, that it's something that, that is not just reserved for those lucky genetic people that are just happy people, right? Uh, it's out there for all of us. Uh, it just takes work. That's a, I love that. That's a great point. Having grace with yourself when you have mistakes. <laughs> the, my friend in the chat, um, Ryan, his name is Ryan Meerstead in the chat, but I know his real name. Uh, he says Kodak counts as Andrew's kid, right? Uh, yeah, definitely. He does. That's my dog Kodak. Um, he's, he's my child basically. Um, but <laughs> All right. So yeah, definitely. And that, I think pets are super important for, yes, uh, they are. for, for this similar kind of social engagement. They can't talk back to you necessarily, <laughs> but uh, I think dogs and, and to some extent cats too are very emotional <laughs> and able to read your emotions. And I know that there's been times when I'm maybe having like a, a breakdown or something and, and my dog can tell he he'll come up to me and know that something is really wrong with me. Um, so I, I think that they can also be super, super important on that social engagement level. And um, I think that there's something uh, before you kind of move to another topic, allegrooming. Uh, yeah, so mm -hmm. allegrooming, it's a term that is used to describe something that like every mammal pretty much does. I, uh, and I mean, you see it a lot with higher order primates and something that, that we've kind of lost a little bit as humans, uh, but it's it's non-sexual touch, right? It's they, we get, and there's lots of research that shows like just spending time with pets, like petting pets, like grooming pets produces a ton of well-being, not just for the dog, the dog's getting a lot of enjoyment, like his legs shaking or whatever, but, uh, <laughs> But that that touch is actually giving you well-being as well, right? You look at these monkeys that are like picking bugs off of each other or whatever. Uh, it's not just this like Zen experience. It's actually like it's built into our biology. We feel good when we're touching other people and other animals. Um, and so it, as a strategy for well-being, it's uh, you don't need it doesn't need to be sexual, but any kind of like even getting your hair cut like. Uh, these moments where like you're getting a massage, something like that, uh, engaged in kind of non-sexual uh, touch with other people actually does produce a lot of the hormones and a lot of the stuff that gives you a sense of well-being. Yeah. And <clears throat> a little bit more uh, mercenary way to look at it. If you're a, a <laughs> server at a restaurant or anything like that, um, touching your your patrons a little bit might might uh, tap into that allo grooming thing so there you know if, if you walk away with nothing else there's a hack you can use and then uh, ryan in the chat says give me that oxytocin delicious i agree get that oxytocin from those social interactions yeah. along with those uh endogenous opioids and endocannabinoids it's gonna feel good um okay so uh, we talked about the three good things exercise and three good things and, and why they were good. Um, but then there's also this, uh, the, there's this larger finding that gratitude, being grateful um, for other people, for things they've done for you or, or just that they're in the world is a, a great source of joy, of, um, of kind of tapping into this, uh, these positive emotions. Um, but something that's not too often talked about that I heard about on, on Andrew Huberman and also this uh, positive psychologist, Josh Dixon mentioned it, um, that uh, maybe a more powerful gratitude exercise is to basically th think about someone else, a time when someone else was really grateful for you. So if you can think back to some time when maybe you did something for somebody just out of the kindness of your heart or just something that you did, even, you know, in a business or, or a professional setting um, that somebody was really grateful for. And remembering that uh, is a really powerful way to uh, get some of these these positive emotions. And I think it is also tapping into that that relationship, that social aspect as well. And think about why that works right because i i've I, I love that finding it's it's really interesting and i've, I've tried to like uh dig into a little bit and, and a lot of positive psychology uh 
is it's kind of the scientific wing of humanistic psychology. So humanistic was something Abraham Maslow, many of you may have heard of this like hierarchy of needs. Uh, a lot of that stuff with these really cool theories. And there's a lot of really interesting work that got into like how we flourish as human beings, but there wasn't a lot of science yet. Positive psychology is what brought the science and started to actually measure these things. And But one of the things that really stands out from kind of the hierarchy of needs is we have a need for recognition. We have a need for people actually seeing that we're producing good in the world, right? That we're doing something that's impactful, that we're doing something that's meaningful. And a lot of the times that we get down on ourselves, that that we get into these like shame cycles uh, is really like, am I worthy? Am I worthy? Like, am I actually contributing? Do people actually like me, right? I uh, These types mm. of gratitude practices, like actually thinking about those moments where someone did recognize you, when someone did notice you, right? Those are really powerful because they break these cycles that we're in of really like thinking like everybody hates me, nobody likes me, right? I uh, like think on those moments of when you did something good, when someone recognized you, when you produced something of value, right? Uh, I think that really ties into one of the really high psychological needs that we have as humans. That's a great point. Yeah, that that's really interesting. And um, I was I was only going to uh, mention that it's interesting uh, in Martin Seligman's uh, memoir, he says that he really wasn't very aware of humanistic psychology and really didn't even read it. But then as he got older, he yeah. he started reading it and seeing the connection that he had like yeah. developed this whole field of psychology in, in parallel with with what Maslow and the other humanistic psychologists had been doing. And I think. I think this is a, a good segue into money mm. because money is something that I, uh, I mean, there's, there's all of these cliches out there, like money doesn't buy happiness and all of these things. Right. I, uh, we, I would like to spend just a few moments talking about the fact that money does buy happiness up to a certain extent. Right. And the reason I wanted to kind of jump in now was this, we, we have this idea of the hierarchy in mind. Right. I, uh, when you think about your needs, right? Your your basic needs are food and water, right? Are safety, shelter. Uh, and then above that is kind of social connection, recognition, and then kind of meaning and purpose. But what money does is it gives you the opportunity to bypass the first couple parts of that pyramid, right? Like if you don't have any money, you're not gonna be very happy. Like, we came from a very brutish world, right? It was short, it was ugly, it was brutal for thousands and thousands of years. And it's only been within the couple, the last like 10,000 years that we've started to fit, like form societies and started to actually take care of these basic needs where we're not waking up every day worried about whether we're gonna survive or not. But just having those basic needs met is not what makes us happy. And there was a lot of like philosophers throughout time that thought that like, if only we can get to this place where everybody's needs are met, that everybody's going to be happy. And I think the whole point of this episode is to show that like, that's not the case. Like that gets us so far. And a lot of the the research on money, I think it's, I mean, we're going to have to adjust for inflation, uh, but yeah, it's yeah. like up to 75000 I actually did the... I looked at that. It's Did now, you? unfortunately, because last year it's like uh, eighty four thousand dollars now. So okay, if, if you're going it. with purchasing power, and yeah, right. Whatever. So every dollar up to eighty four thousand dollars a year is going to buy you a lot more happiness, and ultimately because it's going to buy you the freedom to do the things that that we're talking about, to engage socially with other people, to spend time actually thinking about meaning and your values and all of these things, right? But once you cross that threshold, the money is not buying you anything extra. Yeah, that, and that's a that's a great point. Like, it's it's only bringing you up to that sort of neutral or almost may, maybe slightly above neutral point. But it's one of those things where it's it's kind of similar to meeting all your. I mean, like you're saying, it allows you to to buy those maybe those physiological needs in some abstract sense. Like, it allows you to get more sleep to uh, eat, you know, more healthily, or to at least just have more time to, to do the things that, that are at that low, those lower levels of, of Maslow's hierarchy. Yeah. Um, 
and uh, we let's see, we got a question in the chat from Ryan. Uh, having money certainly removes a lot of the worries and problems that money can solve, like healthcare in the U.S. But there's definitely a plateau slash cap to it. Yeah, precisely. That's exactly what we're saying. And um, yeah, above a certain amount, like um, this psychologist who studies these happiness and similar ideas, Dan Gilbert, um, he he mentions that uh, you know billionaires. People like Elon Musk and and Jeff Bezos should be the happiest people in the world. If it's uh, <laughs> exponentially if, right, if money, they should be a hundred billion times happier than most of us. <laughs> but they're not, and uh, so it, it really points to this: there is a plateau, there is a cap. That's a good way to put it. Well, and think about why that is, right? Uh, what the money is buying you are the non psychological needs. Right. It's buying you your food, your water, your safety, your shelter, the opportunity for social engagement. But the psychological needs are the things that we actually have to put in work defining meeting. Right. I've talked a lot throughout this whole episode about this, like values <laughs> assessment. Right. Like, what are my values? Uh, there's like actual like worksheets that you can go through that have like. 150 different things that you can go through and you can rate like I'm uh, I value creativity I value friendship I value love I value this I value that uh and what it shows is that once you get into the psychological realm it's very idiosyncratic it's very mm. personal right like all of these base needs are the same for everybody everybody needs water everybody needs oxygen all of these kind of things but once we get into that psychological realm of like, what is it that we value? What is it that we really want more of in our lives? That's going to be personal. And it's going to be something that we have to spend time actually defining for ourselves and actually seeking and spending effort and energy, like meeting those psychological needs because money's not buying that. It's just buying us the opportunity to do that. There are rich people that are very happy and it's probably because they use their money to cover all their base needs. And then they spend time engaging in all these different categories of positive psychology. Yeah. Yeah. And it's that that pursuit of those those higher psychological values that um, I think like rather than the achievement of them, the, the pursuit itself, when you're pursuing something that's truly deeply valuable to you, can be a source of meaning and, and well-being and uh, flow and joy. And so, yeah, it's definitely that, that's when those like you're saying, that's when that value assessment becomes so important. Um, but man, there, there's like a ton that we could talk about here with these different, <laughs> uh, different strategies. And, um, I mean, I think one that I'd just like to mention before, I don't know if we're going to move on, but maybe we yeah. will talk a little more here. Um, this idea of, of, uh, I've mentioned a few times, but the growth mindset versus the fixed mindset. Um, another way of thinking about that is, um, or maybe an extension of it is, uh, learning to be more optimistic, this like idea of learned optimism of seeing like, okay, not saying everything's going to always work out for the best, not that irrational form of, of optimism, but the idea that I can handle what's going to come, what challenges are going to come and I'm going to grow from them and get better. It's going to get, you know, maybe easier to handle those particular challenges. And therefore I should be optimistic about my future. And just taking on that idea, that kind of extension of the growth mindset, I think encapsulates a lot of what we've talked about here. If you are committed to doing better and um, having a better life and, and you're positive and optimistic about that future, and I think it's all the more likely that it's going to happen. And I'll just, sorry, I just want to say bye to Ryan. He said, got to run in my noon meeting, but glad I was able to catch up on the stream. Keep up the good work. Thank you so much, Ryan. Uh, yeah, Ryan is a, a, a scientist at the University of Colorado. I just outed him, but you don't know his last name, so you can't figure it out. <laughs> uh, I think so. We are kind of running on time. Looks like my audio is a little messed up, but I, uh, I think that this definitely deserves kind of a, a part two episode uh, because there's so much more that we can get in with so much of this stuff because so much of what we're talking about in terms of happiness and all of these things uh, is really getting into the ambiguity of life, right? The fact that there's so many different choices that we can make, uh, how we value this choice over that choice um, is something that a lot of neuroscientists and, and researchers are spending a lot of money and a lot of time trying to figure out like, 
what is it about individual people that these comparative processes make this thing make me feel happier than this thing, right? Um, and I think there's a lot of strategies we can get into on that. Yeah. Um, if you want to jump into that, I was, was uh, sorry, just reading the chat, but yeah, go for it if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think one of the things that, that really stands out to me uh, across a lot of the social science literature um, is that we are comparers. Like we're constantly comparing mm. this thing to that thing, this thing to that thing. Uh, there's interesting study Dan Gilbert did that was really simple, right? Uh, he just had, he had a, a bowl of potato chips sitting out on the, the table. Uh, and he asked people like, how good do you think those potato chips are going to be? Right. But he had these two conditions. One of the conditions, there was a bunch of chocolate on the shelf right behind the potato chips. And in the other condition, there was a bunch of like spam and canned salmon and like mm. caviar or whatever, <laughs> right? Things that we just like think are gross, right? Uh, and what it showed was that the people that had chocolate behind didn't think that the potato chips were going to make them that happy. <laughs> but but the people that saw the spam and I mean, some people might love spam, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but that saw these other things that, that weren't good, air quotes, uh, they thought the potato chips were going to be amazing. What turns out, though, is that once you start eating the potato chips, there's no difference across the two groups. Mm -hmm. Both of them enjoy it the same amount. And so it's highlighting the fact that we engage in these psychological processes where we're constantly comparing ourselves to someone else. We're comparing mm. uh, our choices to other choices, right? It's not that I am making enough money and that's making me happy. It's that I'm making more money than that. So there's the study with this other study with, uh, with income. They said, would you be more happy making $110 <laughs> if everyone else was making $140? Or would you be more happy making 90,000 when everyone else was making 80, right? And most people chose the 90,000 option, even though it's $20,000 less than the other job, right? And so it shows like we're willing to sacrifice $20,000 a year to be making more than our peers, right? To be making more than our colleagues. And so I think something that, that I just really wanted to highlight is that our brain is automatically making these comparisons. We're constantly engaged in this valuation process where we're comparing this to that. And we're, uh, everything's relative, right? Re value is relative. But if we can notice that, if we can actually lean into the fact that we're making these comparisons and catch ourselves when we're doing it and say, it's not about this versus that, it's about what it actually is, right? When yeah. I start eating the potato chips, it's the same regardless, right? That's what we need to start getting into psychologically. Yeah, but. choosing those those more rational values. Like, is it? Do you <laughs> want to make a higher absolute amount of money or a higher amount of money relative to other people? Like, it's and that's such a good point. I had this experience while reading uh, Martin Seligman's book, uh, his memoir called "The Hope Circuit," um, where I was just like, "Wow, this guy is a, an incredibly." intelligent, but also just innovative, creative, um, and highly accomplished, you know, most likely in, in this universe, way more accomplished <laughs> than I will ever be, of course. I mean, he's president of the American Psychological Association. He's founder of an entire field of psychology. He's a world-renowned psychologist. And, um, and I had this moment where I was like comparing myself to this giant this intellectual <laughs> giant and i was like well you know what what's even the point of what i do and and but then i i caught myself and i was like no th that's not the point of of seeing some uh, someone who's done something great or admiring greatness it's yeah. it's um there's this quote i think it's eleanor roosevelt who said uh comparison is the thief of joy and that's what uh taylor's just talking about but on the other hand, there is this aspect of like a positive kind of comparison where you can see somebody who's done amazing things and say, that's really cool. That's amazing. And actually just yesterday I was, I was mountain biking and I was going up the hill and, uh, 
coming up behind me. I, I had to stop because it was too steep. There was all these rocks. I had to walk my bike up. And there's this guy coming up behind me. And he had to be at least 65, 70 years old. And he's <laughs> cranking up this hill. And I just see like the muscles in his legs going. And he's like, have a nice day. And like going by. Me. And I'm like sitting here. And I had the moment. I had the choice of being like, wow, I can feel like crap about myself, about not being able to do what, what that guy can do. Or I can be like, that's inspiring. I want to be like yeah. that guy when I'm 60, 70 years old. I want to do that. And so I think there's there's a psychological shift that you can make that when you when you find yourself comparing yourself to someone else and you say like, oh, I'm, I'm nothing compared to that, try to shift that and say, why is that person so impressive to me? And how can I be inspired by and aspire to what they're doing without getting down on myself in my current journey, my current path? Yeah, and I think so to kind of wrap it all up, put a ribbon around it. I uh, so much of this is psychological, right? It's it's catching ourselves when we end up in these loops and these negative loops. I uh, understanding that there are strategies, but those strategies take effort. They take engagement. They take us take this opportunity to like come online, like think about what you're doing instead of just reacting to the environment around you. Uh, and if you can do that, and if you can actually value these things and value being more happy in your life, uh, there's lots of tools and there's lots of strategies to do it. This, what we're doing right now, I was just thinking about the fact that this podcast hits so many different elements. I feel positive affect right now. I feel engaged. I feel like I'm making social connections with people. I feel like this produces a sense of meaning in me. Like I'm, I'm learning so much more about the brain than just this little subfield that I'm a part of. Uh, and so find those things in your life because like, I, I'm not doing this because we make a bunch of money because we don't, I mean, <laughs> it, we would, we would love some support on, uh, on Patreon, uh, on our gift shop or whatever it may be, but we're doing this because of those other things, right? Because of the fact that it allows us to, to really get a sense of joy and, and meaning out of what we're doing. I love that. Yeah. Same here. Definitely same here. Um, so yeah. And, and, uh, yeah, don't be afraid to kind of branch out and stretch yourself and, and engage in things that, um, you might be a little bit extra time, a little bit more effort to do, but, uh, we'll bring you that, that perma positive emotions, engagement, relationships, meaning and achievements. Um, I feel like we could have gone on for a, a whole nother hour with this yeah. at least. Um, and maybe we will, uh, try to work some of this into the next episode. Um, so everyone stay tuned. Hope to see you in a couple weeks. And uh, yeah, thanks for watching this episode. Make sure to like and subscribe to our channels if you enjoy this kind of content. Um, and check out the podcast, the Social Brain Podcast. There, there's actually another podcast out there called the Social Brain Podcast, but we are just the Social Brain. Uh, so, so don't be confused by that. Um, Anyway, uh, yeah, thanks for checking this out. And as Taylor mentioned, you can, uh, if you want to support us directly um, for a little, make a little bit more impact, uh, go to our Patreon page and you can support us for as little as like a dollar a month. Yep. Awesome. And we, we just appreciate everyone tuning in. Like, uh, this is amazing how many people we're able to, to reach every couple of weeks. And so, so just thank you for continuing to listen. Uh, we would love some support so that we could keep doing this. But we will see you guys for the next one.